Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olewski, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series. I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And in today's webinar, we're going to have some questions answered about Avacapam with Dr. Kevin Byram. These webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education. But before we get started today, I would like to introduce our guest. Dr. Kevin Byram is the director of the Vanderbilt Vasculitis Clinic. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Byram is also the board president for the Vasculitis Foundation. So welcome, Dr. Byram. We're so happy to have you here today. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again, Kathy. You too. And do you, before we get started, do you have any disclosures for us today? Uh, I do not. No disclosures. Other than just being on the board, as you suggest. I think that's important. <laughs> okay, well, let's dive right into our questions that we've received about tapnios, and we're happy to have you give us some answers today. The first one is, can tapnios be used in children? Um, it is not actively FDA approved for the use in pediatric populations. It's only labeled for use for the use in adult populations, but there is an on, this is a very important question. And there's an ongoing clinical trial that uh, Amgen, the maker of the drug is doing to try to answer this question. Um, and so hopefully within a short period of time, we will have some indication uh, about this. This is not a unique problem for this particular drug. Uh, pediatric rheumatologists have struggled with this for a long time because generally medicines will get FDA approved in adult populations first, and then the evidence for pediatric populations comes in after that. So this is a very important question. Yes, and thank you for answering that important question. The next one is, how does tapnios help patients to achieve and sustain remission? Yeah, and uh, it certainly does. Um, the Advocate trial, which is the, the trial that led to its FDA-approved indication in patients with uh, you know moderate to severe active Ankyovasculitis. Uh, that these are the outcomes that that the trial was looking at was uh, achieving remission um, and some instance of sustaining remission. But this is a molecule that uh, affects a certain part of the immune system that brings neutrophils to the site of inflammation, and so it kind of breaks up that immune response. And uh, it certainly, in addition to letting us use lower doses of steroids to achieve that goal. Uh, helps patients achieve remission. There is, uh, I think we'll probably get to it at some point, but there's an ongoing trial that's enrolling. We're actually a site here at Vanderbilt um, looking at the second part of the question, which is this idea of sustaining remission. We do have some evidence that um, uh, avacapan can help sustain remission in the first few months after attaining remission, uh, but there's a, a long study going on right now to help identify its role in maintaining remission long term. Okay, thank you so much. The next question is, tapnea is appropriate for patients with liver disease or a kidney transplant? Yeah, this is a challenging question. The, um, I think my, my, the short answer is that it's a case-by-case -case basis depending on how much the patient might need the medication um, and, and in addition to um, their status with liver disease, whether it's compensated or decompensated, for example, the kidney transplant, whether it's been a complicated course or an uncomplicated course. And so many of these will have to be, um, this question will really have to be answered by the boots on the ground, the provider taking care of the patient in question. It, it, it The um, package insert for tabneos does caution us uh, to be careful for use in patients with uh, liver disease in particular. Um, and so if it is used in these populations, it would need to be monitored very carefully. Okay. Well, thank you. And this is sort of back to the previous question, and it relates to tabneos and maybe somebody who's also taking rituximab for maintenance. In sustained remission, which drug is typically tapered first and why? Mm. It's a great question. It doesn't have an answer as it stands. And in many ways, um, the, I'm not even sure the trial that's ongoing will help answer it uh, because uh, we have, you know, of course, robust evidence for rituximab and its role in maintenance of remission. But rituximab has a very significant 
uh, side effect protocol, uh, side effect profile um, in terms of infections and its long-term impact on the immune system. And so in, in many cases, this is certainly a case-by-case -case basis. There are usually pragmatic and practical things that come into play in terms of cost of the drug, access to the drug, side effects with each drug that might actually play into which drug might be tapered first. Okay, thank you. And then the, the next question is, can Tavnios, which we're saying Tavnios, we address this as an Avacapan question and answer, it's the same thing. So I just wanted mm -hmm. to reiterate that. Does Tavnios need to be tapered or can it be stopped abruptly? When it is being stopped, for whatever reason it's being stopped for, it can be stopped abruptly. There's no specific guidance on needing to taper it, but that there's kind of an implication in the question uh, about kind of why it's being stopped. For example, if it was being stopped for a side effect, then I think, yes, you can just stop it. If it's being more kind of artfully tapered or artfully stopped in the context of a patient doing well and wanting to see how they do off, certainly their provider might opt to taper it in that setting and closely monitor them for uh, signs of clinical relapse. Okay, that answers a lot of questions because that did come up. So that's uh, great to know. And can patients resume taking it if they flare after stopping? Yeah, they certainly could. Again, case by case uh, will need to be a decision uh, made by the provider. But the immune system is interesting in that sometimes it kind of remembers the medicines that it was on. And sometimes flares can be a little bit more difficult to capture. That We see that more evident in some of our other rheumatic diseases like re uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Um, but generally speaking, because of how closely we watch our patients with ankylvasculitis, we can get on top of a of a flare because generally speaking, we're catching them earlier than at initial diagnosis um, when it was, of course, unclear when the if the patient had ankylvasculitis. Okay, thanks. And um, here's a question that came from one of our patients: Was prednisone used together with tavnios in the clinical trials? Uh, yeah, that, that's how the trials were set up um, to evaluate Tavnios with um, prednisone. Now, the caveat there is that prednisone really was only used for four or six weeks, and then it was all Tavnios. And so that certainly is one of the big strengths of Tavnios is the ability to control this disease with low or absent doses of prednisone, depending on what uh, time frame you're talking about in terms of the patient. But uh, I guess to restate it, uh, all of the patients in the trials did get some steroids at the beginning, but uh, those that were uh, uh, randomized to Tavnios, really within a six weeks or so were off of prednisone. So um, we don't really have a lot of great data long-term. I certainly have some in my patient panel that are on Tavnios and a low dose of prednisone long-term because that's what they require to control their disease. Um, and so we have, I think it will take some time to amass the kind of real world data to support those practices. But um, in the clinical trials, it was really all Tavnios all the time. But then the, the providers did have some leeway with, of course, if the patient flared, giving them some steroids. So ultimately, the short answer is yes, but much lower doses of of prednisone with tapneos. Okay, thanks. And speaking of the trial, so somebody wants to know what is the status of ongoing long-term five-year trial and can patients still enroll? Yes, this is the trial that I had referenced earlier. Um, it's a long trial trying to sort out several questions actually about avacapan, tapneos, about its role in long-term management of patients. And it's still fairly early uh, within the first year or so of that trial. So it will take some time to amass this. All the while, I think we'll be getting a lot more real world experience as well. Patients can enroll, uh, but you'll need to talk to your doctor, uh, your rheumatologist, or you know, be evaluated at a, a vasculitis center that is a site for the trial because as with all clinical trials, there's eligibility and um, ineligibility criteria. So if you, particularly if you're a new diagnosis, then it certainly is worth uh, 
evaluating this this probability uh, of joining this trial. The issue is, is that many patients that are already under control are not eligible. It's really kind of new flares, new uh, either new relapses or new new diagnoses um, so that the patients can be randomized appropriately. Okay, and they should maybe just speak with their doctor about that? <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, the next question is, are there specific lab tests to track if Tavnios is working? Uh, there's going to be a lot of different lab tests that your doctor will will evaluate to see if it's working. There's not a, one specific one, but certainly they're looking at inflammatory markers. Many docs are looking at ANCA titers at various stages during, the, uh, during that patient's course. Certainly, if your kidneys were involved, the kidney... Uh, function in the blood work as well as the urinalysis. Um, I'll kind of parlay this into other things that they might be looking at if you had pulmonary involvement. They certainly will be looking at either chest x-rays or CTs or pulmonary function tests. Um, but so that's the long way of saying that it really is, it boils down to more than one single lab. It's really, you know, the uh, the whole clinical picture and whether you're achieving the goals of of clinical remission first of course, using less steroid. And then number three is avoiding, you know, treatment related toxicity, particularly infections. Okay. And uh, the next question, we got so many about this. Um, there were questions from patients related to affordability and insurance coverage, not knowing who to ask, how to find out about that. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, this is a very complex question. And this is some of the practical, pragmatic issues that I uh, referenced earlier, but the the company, uh, Amgen, has pretty good su patient support uh, programs. And so making, if, if your rheumatologist uh, prescribes this medicine, certainly making sure that they uh, are helping fill out the patient assistance programs on the uh, pharmaceutical company's end. Um, there are other ways to like the it kind of depends on the insurance and what support there is um but um for example here at vanderbilt we have uh, a very good uh, clinical pharmacy support that helps uh, get access to not only samples of course that can help patients start the medication but they have access and help us manage the patient assistance programs which help the ongoing management so this is, a, is an expensive medicine, and so it does come through the specialty pharmacy benefit. And so working with whomever, whichever specialty pharmacy is associated with the, with the patient's insurance uh, will help navigate that pathway. And it's just a little bit variable depending on which insurance it is. Um, and then I think we could probably provide it on the webinar, but certainly if there's access issues, I think involving Amgen, and helping, many times they have ex, uh, programs to help patients navigate that approval process. Okay, I, I think that that might be it for our questions. I, I want to um, thank you so much uh, for sh spending your time with us today. And of course, thank you to the Vasculitis Foundation for working with us on patient ed their commitment to patient education and these webinars for the patients. And I think you did a great job answering the questions today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.